So we are currently in the second week of our devotions series, the devotions, the habits of the redeemed. And last week, as we introduced the series, we talked for a little while about this word devotion, right? And that this word devotion is not, doesn't really fit the, the word that we often think about with morning devotions or quiet time, right? But this word devotion actually means a very intense focus, a steadfast commitment, a purposeful dedication, and an unyielding allegiance to something. We are to be devoted first and foremost, of course, to God. But in being devoted to God, we saw last week that we are to be devoted to the apostles' teaching. As followers of Christ, we are to devote ourselves to the word of God. We are to focus on it, pursue it, know it, understand it, live it, breathe it, eat it, drink it. The Word of God should be in our bones. We saw that the Word of God is the active and living Word, right? So when we read the Scriptures, we are not just reading about God, but we are hearing from God as He speaks to us. We see that the Word of God is actually all about Jesus. The Word of God is apocalyptic. It is an unveiling of who Christ is from Genesis to Revelation. So this is our first devotion that we've looked at this in this series, is to devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching. But if you'll see in Acts 2.42, which is kind of the, the foundation, the launching pad, if you would, of this series, uh, we see that the apostles, or has called us, uh, Luke, as he wrote this, talking about these new converts, says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers. So last week, looking at the apostles' teaching, this week, this morning, we are going to be looking at the fellowship, and we are to be devoted to the fellowship. Now, this word, fellowship, is one that is very common within churches, as it should be. Uh, however, when we look at the word fellowship from the scriptures, we see that this is a, this is a loaded, this is a high-octane word, and what has tended to happen throughout church history uh, is that we take this very potent, high-octane word, and we begin to dilute it. We add some water to it and, and so on, and then it eventually begins to be defined as our culture would define it, right? So when we think of fellowship, we read into the text what we think of in our normal life. I heard one pastor growing up that he tried to define fellowship as two fellows in a ship, and it's like, oh, okay, and that, that was my working definition Sadly to say, for most of my life. Uh, but what we see in Scripture is that fellowship is so much more than that. So we don't want to define or understand this word with this diluted uh, definition, but rather we want to see what the Word of God says about fellowship. So what is biblical fellowship? Now, oftentimes when we think about fellowship and in our day, we think Fellowship is, is really just enjoying the company of other people, right? It's time together. It's having a meal together. It's talking. It's sitting next to each other. It is just being around people that we like. I had a conversation with a, a previous pastor in, in Wichita, and he had joined a running club to uh, be able to share the gospel with people, uh, which is great. And he built these, these friendships with these uh, men and women that were part of this running club who were not believers, hoping to be able to share the gospel. And we met one time. He says, man, this group is so good. I have really just good fellowship with them. I have better fellowship with them than I do with the people at my own church. <laughs> I said, no, that's, that's actually not true. That, that statement actually cannot be true. You cannot have better fellowship with these unbelievers, no matter how nice they are. And they might be nicer than the people at his church, all right? And it's sad to say, that's a common story. He might actually feel more relaxed, more accepted, more comfortable with these friends than he does with the people of his own church. They might not be as judgmental. They might not be as critical as the people from his own church. But one thing he does not have is better fellowship. It's impossible. You cannot have better fellowship with unbelievers than you do with the body of Christ. We might see fellowship as maybe just... Um, finding something that we all enjoy together, right? We gather around a common interest. Uh, but that can't be fellowship either, though 
it's great when Christians gather around a common interest. That's why we're here this morning. We want to gather as the people of God around the glory of Christ and see him exalted and see his people transformed. Great things. However, if that definition works, then when you go to the movies, that's fellowship, right? You have 100 or so people that all have similar interests. They laugh together. They cry together. They eat together. They even give money toward the same purposes. But there's nothing about going to a movie that would constitute fellowship. Maybe we could think about fellowship as, um, I want to find people who think the way that I think, right? And the Christian church, Protestant church, really all Catholic, Orthodox, and and Protestant together, uh, we have made a living off of finding people who think like us and saying we'll fellowship together, right? We have all these different denominations, Baptist, Presbyterian, Luther, Anglican, Methodist, and so on. And we think this is how I fellowship is by finding people who I can relate to, that, that believe the same sort of things that I believe. But that's not fellowship either. That's not fellowship either, for we must be able to fellowship with all God's people, not just those who would associate with a certain denomination. If you follow the evangelical happenings in the world, you'll see on Twitter or Facebook or whatever that John MacArthur says one thing and John Piper says something and Tim Keller says something and all of their followers kind of flock to them saying, I'm with Keller, I'm with Piper, I'm with MacArthur, right? And we think that this is a sort of allegiance or fellowship, but that's not biblical fellowship. So what we want to do this morning is dive into the text and understand what biblical fellowship is, how do we define this, how do we understand this, and then we want to look at how do we devote ourselves to the fellowship, as we are told to do in Acts 2.42. So first, what is fellowship? What does this word mean? Well, the word is koinonia, and it means to have a deep association a true communion, close relationship. It is a giving of yourself to others. It's not just meeting occasionally in a church building, shaking hands at the end of the service, laughing, and then going home. True fellowship is never anything superficial, but it is always sacrificial, right? Fellowship is not superficial. To have a good conversation with somebody is not necessarily fellowship. Fellowship is sacrificial to the core. It is a giving of ourselves to somebody else. It is is pouring ourselves out for others. It is deep, it is vital, and it should become the main thing in our lives. When people become Christians, they become one with each other. They enter into this community, this fellowship. They are brought into a family, they are united by certain bonds that are actually indestructible. The fellowship that we are to have with one another is that bond that we have with brothers and sisters in Christ. Fellowship is more than just knowing each other. Fellowship is understanding who we are as a body. It's understanding who we are in union with each other and in union with Christ. It is truly caring for other people and pouring ourselves out for other people. To experience true fellowship is to love one another. But it's not only to love one another, it is to be loved, right? It's, uh, for a lot of us, we, we go on one side or the other. You have some people that all they want to do is be loved, but they have a hard time loving others. And then you have other people that, man, I want to love all of these people, but as soon as somebody returns that towards me, I get uncomfortable, Right? Neither one of those is healthy within biblical fellowship. Fellowship is loving others and receiving love from others. Fellowship is giving of yourself to others, and it is receiving or allowing yourself to receive from others. Fellowship is knowing one another, and it is allowing yourself to be known. Fellowship is taking others by the hand and leading them to Jesus. And it's allowing somebody else to take you by the hand and leading you to Jesus. This begins to help us describe what fellowship really is and its full high-octane definition. However, fellowship is not just the relationship that we have with each other or that you have with each other. It's not just horizontal. 
Fellowship, to be biblical fellowship, must be horizontal and vertical, right? It must be a relationship that you and I have where Christ is at the center. In fact, if I try to have a relationship with Jesus, with God, apart from anyone else, this is not true fellowship. And then if we try to have a relationship apart from Christ being at the center where there's no vertical, that's not true fellowship. This is why this particular uh, man who said he had fellowship with these runners actually did not. You cannot have fellowship, the biblical definition of fellowship, if Christ is not at the center. Christ is the center of our fellowship. John mentions this in 1 John 1.3. John, the apostle of, of Jesus, is now a pastor in Ephesus. He's gone through, this is near the end of his life, he's had quite the life. Revelation, all of these things going on, writing a gospel. And now he's near the end of his life and he's writing these letters. And he is speaking in the plural, we. And this is referring to not only him, but the elders that are with him, if there's other apostles with him. We, those who have seen and heard, he says, we proclaim also to you, right? That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. So that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So if we were to break this down just a little bit, we see at the very beginning, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you. So what is it that they have seen and heard? This is John speaking of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is speaking of God himself putting on flesh and dwelling amongst us. He is speaking of Jesus, the Messiah, the, the anointed one, the king who has finally come and now has brought people to himself in the gospel, in uh, the grace of the cross and the resurrection to join him in this cosmic renewal project, right? This is what the gospel is. It's the good news that Jesus is reigning, and now he is restoring all of creation into his kingdom. This is the gospel that they have heard and known and have, or seen and heard and have proclaimed to these people. So that, he says, here's the purpose statement. This is why we have proclaimed this good news. So that you too may have fellowship with us. See, John knows the intrinsic human need for biblical fellowship can only be experienced if you have been saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have seen this, we have heard this, we have proclaimed this to you so that you can have fellowship with us. Because if you don't understand who's sitting on the throne, if you don't understand who's at the center of your life, if you don't understand who rules and reigns, we can't have fellowship. He is at the center of it, right? So that you can have fellowship with us. And then he goes on. And indeed, our fellowship, this fellowship John is inviting us into, is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. So this fellowship is not just between John and the churches. It's not just between us, but it is also the fellowship that we have with the Father and Jesus Christ. Paul later talks about the fellowship of the Spirit. If we look at the whole scripture, we see that our fellowship with God is a fellowship with the triune God. And it is only when that fellowship is at the center that we can have fellowship with one another. So again, we cannot be devoted to just a horizontal fellowship or just to a vertical fellowship, but it must be both of those coming together in Christ and in his people. Then maybe one of the best ways to understand this biblical fellowship um, is to see that there is a, a theme throughout the scriptures of uh, the body of Christ, right? It's a body. We see Paul using this language often. He speaks of true fellowship as uh, working together in the same way that a body works together. We see this uh, come up in, in, in Colossians chapter 1. Jesus even says that Jesus is the head of the body, which is the church, right? So Paul, tell, talking to Christians, telling them to have 
unity with one another, he implores us by appealing to the fact that we are not just individuals who have been saved. It, that's not what salvation is. It's not just about all these individual souls going to heaven, but it is about creating a people for himself, a body for himself on earth. So he says in Colossians 1 that Jesus is the head of the body and the body is the church. So to be devoted to this fellowship, as we are called to do, it is absolutely imperative that we look at our brothers and sisters in Christ, not just as people, individuals, but as part of our body. Paul highlights this in Romans chapter 5, or chapter 12, excuse me, verse 5. Romans 12, 5, Paul says, So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. So if we were to look at this, if we were to break it down a little bit, we see that first two words, so we, those are all those who have been redeemed by Jesus, all those who have been brought in to this renewal purpose, this, this covenant of, of uh, this new covenant in Christ that is to see all creation redeemed, renewed, and restored to Christ, all things submitted to him. We've been brought into this mission. That's the other thing. When, when we think about Christian fellowship, it's not something that just happens kind of on its own or on an island or just in the local church. It's not stagnant. It's always moving somewhere. Right? So when we enter the faith, when God saves somebody and brings them into the fellowship, we get to stand in a current where we look backwards and we see for over 2,000 years that Christ has been redeeming a people, building a fellowship, and we see that this stream is moving. It's moving us toward something. So to, to enter the fellowship is not like entering a, a country club where you get to go and just hang out and have fun and have people give you good food and good drinks and so on. It's, it's so much more than that. It's purposeful. It's, it, there's a mission to it. And that mission is the mission of the church, which is to see, again, Christ's redemption go to the ends of the earth. So this is the we Paul is talking about in Romans 12, 5. So we, those who have been redeemed by the power of God, though many, right, there's 3,000 of them at Pentecost that got saved, and today, there's an estimated 2.2 billion Christians in the world. That's many. So we, though many, even over 2 billion of us, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. So together, we have been fused to the Messiah. We have been brought in to the very life of the king of the world through faith we have been united into the very life of Christ and his church. We are his body on earth, and he is our head. Augustine looked at this. He spent a lot of time thinking about this, the church father, and he called this the totus Christus, the, the total Christ, that Jesus is not identified in the scripture as just the head of the church, but he, he has a body. Right, And we want to see the glory of Christ. We want to see the, 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 the power, the life of Jesus go to the ends of the world. Right, The only hope for the world is the life of Christ. There is no other hope. However, how does this hope get to the world? By his hands and his feet and his mouth proclaiming this hope. And who are his hands and his feet and his mouth but the church? We are his body. We are his hands in this world. We are his feet in this world. We are the very voice of Christ as we proclaim the good news of the gospel to those who need to hear it. This is why when there's division in the church, it is such an egregious sin against God. If the church is the body of Christ, if the church is that total Christ, the totus Christus, if the church are Christ's hands and Christ's feet and Christ's mouth. When there's division, what does that mean? Paul, he, he saw the absolute craziness of, of a divided church in Corinthians when he wrote to them and he said, you know, some of you are following Paul, saying I'm of Paul. Some of you are saying I'm of Apollo. Some, I'm of Cephas. 
He goes, is Christ divided? Is Christ divided? He doesn't say, is the church divided? He doesn't say, are your affections divided? He doesn't say, are your, um, are your community groups divided? He says, no, is Christ divided? If we are the body of Christ, what does that mean when we are divided? Paul asked the question. He said, this is how crazy it is. Are you really going to say that Christ is divided? The one who is able to reconcile all things to himself, can he not help you figure out this little tension point? But that means that we have to be humble, and we have to be able to accept correction, and we have to be able to pursue Jesus, which are things that our flesh just battles against constantly. May we not be divided. Christ is not divided. So, here's the reality. When we fail to devote ourselves to the fellowship, this fellowship being the body of Christ, united with one another, likewise united with Christ, who is the head of the body, when we fail to devote ourselves to that fellowship, to that body, we fail to devote ourselves to Christ. We cannot say that we are devoted to Jesus, but not his church. How many of you have heard people talk like this? I've had more conversations than I care to count of people who've been offended, burnt by a church. It says, you know what? I love Jesus, but I don't love his church. I would say, well, if that's the case, you don't love Jesus. Christ is not divided. You cannot say that you love the head and not the body. You cannot say you love the groom and not the bride. You cannot say you love the father and not his children. If you said those things to me in our relationship, say, Kyle, I really like you, but I really cannot stand your kids. Right? We have a problem there. <laughs> if you were to say, Kyle, I really like you, but I want nothing to do with your wife, we are not in fellowship with one another. Yet we do this with Jesus all the time. Right? I love Jesus, but I can't not stand his bride. I love the head of the body, but I cannot stand the rest of it. This should never be named among us. It should never be named among us. We are to devote ourselves to the fellowship, the body of Christ, united with Christ. You know, when we live as if the church is just another friend group, another circle, people that I see maybe a few times a month, if we are not devoted to the fellowship of Christ and his people, we're not devoted to God. If all the church is is just another group of people that I have as acquaintances and a couple friends that I see a few times a month, we are not devoted to the fellowship. We are not devoted to Christ, to God. And you know what? This is exactly what the enemy wants. He loves division. He does not want us to be devoted to the church or to Christ. He does not want us to be devoted to the fellowship. He wants us to be and, and exist and live in isolation, alone, away from everyone. He wants us to process alone, to suffer alone, to worship alone. He wants us distracted and apathetic toward the church and her mission. You see, the enemy hates Christian fellowship, which is why he is always trying to pull it apart. If it wasn't a threat to him, he would not try to destroy it. And Jesus even says that essentially the greatest apologetic for a whole world to see is disciples of Christ loving each other. They will know that you are my disciples by the love you have for one another. There's a story um, about a church father named Origen, and uh, there was this critic of Christianity early on, you know, around like 250, 300 A.D., uh, and he, he wrote this horrible critique of Christianity. And some time later, it takes a while for publications to go out and circulate at this time, but it was a, felt like a devastating critique by Celsus was his name. Uh, and, and the church came to Origen and said, will you write a response to this? And Origen said, yeah, dutifully. He picked up, yeah, this is my duty. This is my task. I'll do that. And he wrote what is perhaps one of the greatest Christian apologetic books that has ever been written in the history of the church. But he says this. He says, you know, I can write this book as an apologetic, a defense for the faith, 
But really, the church needs no defense. Jesus doesn't speak with words, but rather he speaks through the fellowship that his disciples have. He says the church is going to be just fine from any critique if they are loving one another. There is no charge that can come against the people of God that will stick if we are truly devoted to the fellowship. That's a paraphrase of what he said, not verbatim. The enemy despises the fellowship. He hates it when we are encouraging one another. He wants to fight against us bearing one another's burdens. He hates it when we forgive one another. He wants us to be condemned constantly and and angry. But when we forgive one another, truly forgive one another, he hates it. He hates it when we gather together on the Lord's day. And he hates it when we confess our sins to one another. Our fellowship is one of the greatest weapons against the enemy. And that is why he wants us to be isolated. That's why he wants us to be alone. That's why he wants us to not devote ourselves to the body. But those feelings of wanting to be alone, wanting to protect ourselves, not wanting other people to see our shame, that's very natural. We all can identify with that to a certain degree. However, those are lies. It is, it is not good for us to live in isolation, but rather it is good for us to devote ourselves to the fellowship. We need each other because individually, as Paul says, we are members one of another. As any physical body has multiple members, so the body of Christ has many members. Your body has hands and feet and eyes and elbows and ears, all different body parts, but they are individually members one of another. And we know this to be true if you've ever walked with bare feet on hardwood floor and stepped on a Lego, (laughs) right? That pain will cause your entire body to jump into action including perhaps the words that are hidden in your heart, right? My mom used to say, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Like, oh, man, I did not realize that was in there until I stepped on this Lego. The point is your whole body reacts, right? If there is, if there is a, uh, if, you, if you do something to damage your body, I remember hitting my thumb with a hammer really hard, and the whole body hurts, right? All the way down to my toes, I can feel it. And this is because though individual members we are all a part. We are all connected. We are individually members one of another. We are connected. And this is the way the body of Christ is to operate. To be in fellowship with one another is to suffer with those who suffer. It is to rejoice with those who rejoice. How could a member of our body slam their toe, and the rest of the body not react. That's not right. That's not good. That's evil. In fact, Christ died to make that not the case. Jesus went to the cross, and before he went to the cross, one of his last phrases in his prayer to God was, Lord, let them be one even as you and I are one. Christian fellowship, this high octane, this powerful phrase is something we must be devoted to because Christ died in order to bring us together. Is Christ divided? Functionally, we divide him when we are not devoted to one another, when we do not suffer with those who suffer and rejoice with those who rejoice. So we have seen that this fellowship is far more than just a casual friendship, but it is the very life of the Christian. The fellowship is where the people of God are united to each other as the body, and where the body is united to Christ as the head of the church. This is what fellowship is. It is being devoted to each other in Christ. The body being members of the body. It is the body of Christ being the body of Christ. It's not just identifying it as so, but it is us being committed to living that out and walking with one another, bearing with one another.
So if this is what the body of Christ is, we see in Acts 2.42 that we are to devote ourselves to it. We are to devote ourselves to the fellowship. So what does that, what does it look like, right? We've seen that there's a, a unity there of one of another in Christ. We are together. But what does it look like to devote ourselves to the fellowship? Well, as we saw last week, uh, we are also to devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, the word of God. And by God's grace and faithfulness, the apostles' teaching, the word of God, has a lot to say about how we are to devote ourselves to the fellowship, right? It has a lot to say. In fact, there are, there are over 60 one another verses in the New Testament. This is just the New Testament. You have a whole bunch in the Old Testament as well. You have over 60 one another verses in the New Testament, and every single one of those verses is helping us to understand what it looks like to devote ourselves to the fellowship. This is not just an abstract idea that in my heart I'll be devoted to the fellowship. Right? It, no, it is, it is holistic. It is every part of us from top to bottom, inside out, are to be devoted to the fellowship. So if we look at some of these one another verses, we would see uh, a list like this. Uh, we see be at peace with one another. You devote yourself to the fellowship by being at peace with one another. It's not easy or natural to be at peace with one another. It is something we have to fight for. It is something we have to wrestle with. It is something that we have to be militant about. We must be at peace with one another. Be of the same mind with one another. Be kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving to one another. Bear with one another and forgive one another. Confess our sins to one another. Encourage and build up one another. Stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Pray for one another. Be hospitable to one another. And the list goes on and on. These one another verses teach us, show us, display for us how it is that we are to be devoted to the fellowship. We are to look at one another as higher than ourselves, as worthy of honor, as those who we are to pour ourselves out for in Christ. All right? So uh, another way that we can think about this is we are to do all of the one another verses, but we can also look at the body of Christ as an example as well, the body itself. Paul talks about in Corinthians how, you know, the body has eyes and, and hands, but what happens when the hand gets upset at the eyes and wishes it was, and, and, and it says, we must live at unity with one another, right? He goes, he goes through the different body parts. So when we think about practically devoting ourselves to one another, we can even look at the human body. We can start with the top. How, how do we think about one another? How are we to think about the fellowship? And then moving down, how do we speak to and about one another? What does speech look like when you're devoted to the fellowship? You look at your hands. How are we to serve one another? And we can look at our feet and say, how are we to walk or how are we to live as being devoted to the fellowship? So let's, let's do that. Let's think about how do we think with our minds? How do we speak with our mouths? How do we serve with our hands? How do we live or walk with our feet? Well, if we start with the fellowship and how are we to think, how often do we allow our minds to wander in relation to our brothers and sisters in Christ? Scripture tells us to take every thought captive and to think upon those things that are good. Paul says in Philippians 4.8, Finally, brothers, another word for the fellowship, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellent, any excellence, if there is any worthy of praise, think about these things. These are the things that we are to think about. These are the things that we should set our minds to in regards to how we think about one another. Now, this does not mean that we become ignorant toward evil or ignore sin, right? This does not mean that we just kind of whitewash everybody and think of happy thoughts, that's not what he's saying here. But what he's saying is that our, our minds should be engaged to think well of one another, to look at one another as image bearers whom Christ has died for, has redeemed. This is how we are to view each other. 
It calls us to think rightly. And our, if our minds are consumed with criticism and disapproving thoughts, we will not be able to devote ourselves to the fellowship because we'll look at the bride of Christ and think that, honestly, she's not worth my time. If our minds are just racing and constantly full of critical and judgmental thoughts about the body of Christ, when we come into church, when we come into contact with those who we are supposed to be devoted to, we won't want anything to do with them because we've already decided who they are. We've already torn them apart, top to bottom. This should not be the way we think about one another. You know, Paul says that we are to uh, think about whatever is just, right? Just, this is, this is good, right judgment, right? So if, if there's a situation, let's say there's, there's sin, there is something broken within the fellowship, to think rightly, to think justly, to judge rightly is to enter into that situation, see how do we move forward, and, and, and strive to go forward and on the right path. That's how you judge a situation rightly. But to judge a situation rightly is very different than being judgmental, right? To judge is different than to be judgmental. To judge is to enter into it. To be judgmental is to say, I don't know what that is, but it's ugly, it's bad, it's gross, they're, they're pathetic, they're a bunch of losers, they are, they are not worth my time, I don't even want to be around these people. That's judgmentalism. That should not be named among us. We should not think that way. If we see a brother or sister suffering or in pain or tripping or falling, we are to judge the situation right, enter into it, and see them healed. We are not to be judgmental people. So if our thoughts are constantly critical and judgmental, we have no capacity to give or receive grace from one another. We will become isolated and alone. And the blessings of the fellowship will feel very far away. It it matters how we think about one another. So not only are we to devote our thoughts to the fellowship, but we are also to devote our words to the fellowship. How are we to speak? How are we to, to speak about one another? James tells us in his epistle that the tongue is a deadly fire. It is something that must always be kept on a leash because it cannot be tamed, right? We have a dog. His name is Samson. He's a pit bull mastiff mix. He's an awesome dog. He's a very mean looking dog, but I've, but he's, he's tame. He's, he's, he's never bitten anyone. He comes when I call him. He loves the kids. He's a good dog. I don't have to keep him on a leash because I've trained him, tamed him, The tongue is impossible to tame. The tongue must always be kept on a leash. There is no man on earth. In fact, James says, listen, you can can tame all the exotic animals in the world, but the tongue, you don't have a chance. You don't have a chance. That thing must always be kept on a leash. And to be devoted to the fellowship in the way that we speak is to, to realize that. And it is to keep the tongue on a leash at all times. How is it that we speak to and about one another? Our words can build people up. Our words can build up a community. It can build a church. It can build a marriage. It can build a family. But words can also tear all of those things down. It takes very few words to tear all of that down. Words matter. Do we use our words to encourage one another? Or do we slander each other? Do we seek to honor one another with our words, or do we dishonor? Do we speak words of life to and about the fellowship, the people of God, those who we are members with in the body of Christ, or do we gossip and disrespect one another? Proverbs 10 has a lot of individual proverbs about words, the speech, mouth, the tongue, it says this in Proverbs 10, 11, and then I'll go through a couple. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. You know the blessing it is when you talk to somebody who is righteous in their speech, and you have a conversation. It's like, man, you have just, you have just given me life. <laughs> Your words were, 
wise. They were encouraging. They were, they were right in the moment for me. It feels like a fountain of life. Is that the way you speak? Do you speak with words as a fountain of life? It says the tongue of the righteous is choice silver. The lips of the righteous feed many. The mouth of the righteous brings forth wisdom. The lips of the righteous know what is acceptable. They know when to speak, how to speak, and what to say. Church, our words really do matter. And not just the words that we say in public, but the words that you say to your spouse when you're home alone and the door is closed matter. The the words that you say to your best friend when nobody else is around matter. And they matter because Christ, who is the head, hears everything you say about his body. And as you do that, we we begin to pull apart and divide the body as we use our words, even in private, to slander and malign people. This should not be how we speak. Our words should be life-giving, whether we're in private or we're in public. It must always be kept on a leash. (laughs) We must not let them just run rampant because they will burn the whole world down. So we've thought about how we think, how we are to speak. And what about our hands? How are we to serve the fellowship? How are we to serve the fellowship? The fellowship is not just a sentimental feeling of oneness, right? When we think about fellowship, it's not just like, oh, good, I'm so glad my friends are here, and everything's just nice and, and, and harmonious and good. That's not fellowship. It's not coffee and cookies. It's not a meal together. Though all of these things are part of it, right? These are all part of the fellowship, and they're necessary, but by themselves, they don't define the fellowship. Fellowship doesn't just take place because we're at church together. Fellowship comes through giving and serving. True fellowship costs. True fellowship will cost you something. So many people never know the joys of Christian fellowship because they have never learned to truly devote themselves to the fellowship. They've never truly devoted their time, their service, their resources to the people of God. And when we are not giving, when we are not serving, when we are not pouring ourselves out in acts of service for one another in one way or another, we are not experiencing the true joy of the fellowship. Not only are we not experiencing it, but we are not devoting ourselves to it, which we are called to do. We must give to one another, and we must figure out how to do that. We must figure out, we must be able to know each other and look around and say, man, I could really help this person by cooking them dinner or mowing their lawn or babysitting their kids. These are ways that we can serve one another. And the fellowship, the people of God pouring themselves out for each other. In fact, it's not up on the screen, but in Acts 2.42, a couple verses down, in verse 44 and 45, he says this, and all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need, right? They were so devoted to this fellowship, to these people, that they were saying, oh my goodness, here's a family that really needs a car. I've got three of them. I can sell one and give them money to buy a car, or I can just give them the car. It is is just being aware of who's in the fellowship and what the needs are, and it is serving one another. Then finally, what's the last one? We are to think rightly. We are to speak rightly. We are to serve rightly, but we are also to walk or live rightly when we are devoting ourselves to the fellowship. 1 John 1, 6 and 7 says this, If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Church, if we're going to be devoted to the fellowship, we must walk faithfully before God. We must strive to live and walk in the light. For if we say that we are in the light, but we don't have fellowship, then then we're lying, right? We, We are, God has called us 
to be devoted to one another. And the way that we do that primarily is by living a life of faithfulness before God. There is a very, a very true um, reality about, about this, this group of people right here. And that, that truth is that I and my family, we need you to walk faithfully before God. Like, if, if you don't, that, that's part of the body that is hurt. That's a diseased member of the body, and it affects everyone. Whether you realize it or not, it really does. My kids need you to walk faithfully. You and your kids need me to walk faithfully. We need each other to walk faithfully as we live before the Lord, as we devote ourselves to the fellowship. For if we walk in darkness, it does great damage. The whole body is then pulled, and we want to figure out how do we, how do we figure this out. We must pursue Christ. And that doesn't mean that there's, we don't experience pain or sorrow or suffering or anxieties or depression or, 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 or any of these things that are very real. That doesn't mean that you're walking in darkness if you experience those things. But we take those things and we bring them together into the light and we walk faithfully before God toward restoration and healing and glory to God. We need each other to be devoted to the fellowship in the way that we live. And if Exodus Church will do this, if we will think, if we will speak, if we will serve and we will live our lives as being devoted to the fellowship, the body of Christ, and dwelled by the Spirit, connected to Jesus as the head of the body, the church, if we live that way, man, the, the, the whole world will not be able to contain what can come from that. The, the disciples later on in Acts, it says they literally, not literally, they turn the world upside down, figuratively. <laughs> they turn the world upside down. And that was because of the fellowship that they had. They were united, like-minded, thinking, speaking, serving, and living faithfully before, the God, before our God. And let that be true of us. Amen? All right, let's pray.